Um, this is our first Center for Excellence in Disabilities Ability Grand Rounds for the year, the 2023-24 year. So thanks for joining our first one and getting it going. Um, my name is Dr. Leslie Cottrell. I have the opportunity to, to um, be the director at the center and get to introduce our speakers. And today, um, our very first one, Dr. Hassett, I wanna tell you a little bit about her and then turn it over to her. Um, just before we get going, I'm gonna, or as I'm talking, um, I'm gonna uh, move the slide so that we have maybe um, just some Zoom etiquette as we go. We do have closed captioning provided uh, for each presentation. You would be able to click um, that option at the bottom of the Zoom screen, and we do offer certificates for attendance if you need that. Um, also remember to mute your line initially, but we really want active participation, whether that is putting something in the chat throughout the presentation, or we're gonna get a little bit of time for questions at the end. Um, while we are getting situated, if you wanna provide your name and affiliation in the chat, that makes us uh, you know, get connected initially, know who's on here, and um, that's really helpful. Thank you for using your camera. I see many great faces, new faces, um, faces I know. It's always nice to see faces. Um, and then feel free to raise your hand for clarity. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing so that Dr. Hassett can go ahead and get her files um, uploaded. And while I do that, let me tell you a little bit about her now. Um, Dr. Hassett um, is a physiotherapist and a mid-career academic at the University of Sydney. God love her, she's joining us from a, a long way away. Um, so she is, has an academic role in the Sydney School of Health Sciences and a research intensive academic role in the Institute for Musculoskeletal Health, leading the research theme of physical activity for people with physical disabilities. Professor Hassett is currently seconded from her academic role to the leadership team of the Implementation Science Program within Sydney Health Partners, an NHMRC accredited Advanced Health Research and Translation Center. She also holds an honorary senior research fellowship position in Southwestern Sydney Local Health District, where Dr. Hassett worked clinically for 15 years in brain injury rehabilitation. In 2020, Dr. Hassett received the Vice Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Research and Teaching. You can see the title of today. We're gonna to start with traumatic brain injury and, and um, an area well known to um, our center's area of emphasis. With that, Dr. Hassett, I'll turn it over to you and thank you so much for joining us and being our speaker today. Thanks so much, Leslie. Um, and I hope we have the tech goes well today because <laughs> you start presenting and you never know if people can hear you okay. So I'm, I'm hoping it all goes smoothly. Um, yeah, so thanks so much for the opportunity to speak today. And I'm actually, you're the first group that I'm actually sharing all of this information with. Um, so I'm talking today about some uh, clinical practice guidelines that we've just developed for traumatic brain injury. And they just went live last week and I will share the link at the end um, for public consultation at the moment. So uh, it was very exciting to pull this uh, presentation together for you today. All right, so I think we're, we're, I've introduced, so I can go through this quickly. Yeah, so I work at the University of Sydney um, and, and within the discipline of physiotherapy. So I teach the physiotherapy students and conduct research. Um, and broadly, my research is around physical activity and people living with disability and you know, particularly looking for increasing access and opportunities for physical activity and trying to work better on that link between health and out into the community. Uh, so as mentioned, um, my, where I do my research uh, is in the Institute for Musculoskeletal Health, which is part of the university, and it's also uh, part of one of our local health districts, so we're embedded in that, and I lead the, the disability theme within our physical activity, ageing and disability stream. 
And then the last bit, so I wear a couple of different hats, um, is that I, I co-lead the Implementation Science Academy. So certainly over the last, I don't know, maybe uh, seven years or so, um, I've had you know much more of an interest in the, the science of implementation science, and a lot of my research is focused in that way. So we know a lot of things that work, um, but we need to do a lot better at how we can embed that um, routinely into clinical practice. So, uh, but my clinical, so I, I did work as a physiotherapist for 17 years clinically and 15 of those were spent here at the brain injury unit, uh, which is, was at Liverpool Hospital, which is one of our major trauma hospitals here in Sydney, Australia. And uh, so, yes, so based in New South Wales, so I'm not sure how many of you have made the long journey to Australia, um, but yes, yeah, so I live in New South Wales and that's where I worked. Uh, and so within the state of New South Wales, um, we have uh, what's called a brain injury rehabilitation program. So we have three um, three in three adult centers that where if you need inpatient rehabilitation, you come to Sydney and you have your your rehabilitation there. And then we have a whole range of smaller services like transitional services and community, uh, support services that are spread throughout New South Wales that support people as they go home if they live more rurally and remote um, in New South Wales. So a little bit about my research. So as a clinician, um, I you know, was very fortunate to work in places that were um, always, there was always research going on. Um, and so while I was working as a clinician, I was interested in the role of fitness training um, and fitness testing after traumatic brain injury. So working with a lot of uh, younger people who had sustained their brain injury, you know, they're very deconditioned and really, you know, wanting to get back to, to everyday life. Um, and so I became interested in, in wanting to know more about how we could do better at improving fitness. So I embarked on a PhD and so I, I lead the Cochrane Review on fitness training. Um, Postdoc, I've done uh, quite a bit of work around the use of technology in rehabilitation. And so we've got a, a big trial that we conducted here in Australia to which we showed that the use of additional technology um, uh, focusing on improving mobility, uh, that that's able to increase people's mobility overall. So we're doing some work now in the implementation space uh, from that trial. And then, yeah, broadly, I do a whole heap of different projects looking at physical activity. So trying to link more into community sports and recreation, looking at how we measure physical activity for people who have movement difficulties, and then really looking at the role of health professionals in promoting physical activity. So um, focusing on people with traumatic brain injury, um, what we do know is that um, on average, people who sustain a severe traumatic brain injury are very deconditioned. So these are um, all the studies that have used gas analysis um, to measure maximal oxygen capacity uh, in people living with traumatic brain injury. And overall, what we see is if we compare the, the values from these studies to uh, age-matched values um, and sex-matched values as well, we see that um, overall people sit um, well below the um, well below the average, well below um, low fitness for their age and sex. So um, we're able to see from these studies that people overall are very deconditioned after they have a traumatic brain injury. Uh, as part of my PhD, we put together a, um, a model as to, you know, to understanding why people are deconditioned. And there's a lot on there you don't need to, to worry about. But, but overall, that people are deconditioned because of um, your typical central factors from changes in the pulmonary and the cardiac system, um, quite a lot of changes in the peripheral system. And some of that is because of the traumatic brain injury and the hormonal changes that happen. But then there's also, because of the brain injury itself, there's some other central components that make it difficult for people to be able to do a maximal um, exercise performance. Um, but from this work, what really struck me was that um, a big contributor was physical inactivity. 
and so it's really this relationship between reduced fitness and physical activity that really um, moved me from being focused just on fitness training to thinking more broadly around physical activity. Um, so if we think about uh, physical activity, we can think about it as in regards to the intensity of activity that's done. Uh, so a light, the yellow ones, the yellow types of activities showing light physical activity, the red ones moderate, and the green ones vigorous physical activity. We can also think about um, different types of physical activity within different domains, so household, work-related, leisure and transport. And these are just some examples of different activities. Um, there's a wonderful compendium of physical activity where you can look at what the oxygen requirements are um, for these different activities. Uh, so this is in METs. So if we look at mowing the lawn, that's a MET value of 5.5. So what that means is that it takes five and a half times the amount of oxygen uh, that you require when, you, when you're just sitting quietly to be able to mow the lawn. And so if we then look at someone's fitness level, so this is um, the, the average fitness level from the previous slide I showed you of people living with TBI. We can see if we start to look at some of these activities that people want to get back to and perform, that... Um, if they have a lower fitness, then they're actually going to have to work at a higher percentage of their capacity to be able to do these everyday activities. Mm -hmm. And that can become very fatiguing for people. Um, and so then they may not want to do it because it makes them really tired. But unfortunately, if people stop doing more activity, then their fitness reduces and then the activities become even more fatiguing. So we can see this really vicious cycle happening. And so we want to look at how we can improve fitness and how we can get people engaged in physical activity um, to have all those benefits that we know that come from physical activity, both psychological as well as physical, as well as reducing the risk of um, earlier death and living with chronic conditions. So in 2020, uh, the World Health Organization did their update of the physical activity guidelines. And for the first time, they included guidelines for people living with disability. So they included children and adolescents and adults uh, living with a disability. And they, they looked at eight different health conditions. Uh, it, it didn't include traumatic brain injury, um, but it did include stroke and Parkinson's disease. And so they looked at the evidence for those um, health conditions. And then they also looked at what the evidence was from the general population. Uh, and, and in the end, they, they found you know, evidence supporting for, um, from those eight health conditions that they looked at. But they really ended up deciding that, um, that they were going to recommend the same amount of physical activity for people living with disability as what they do for the general population. But then they also included some good practice points that were really specific for people living with disability. Um, and so from these guidelines, what's recommended is that uh, adults living with disability should aim to do at least 150 to 300 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity a, a week um, for children, at least 60 minutes a day um, to do additional uh, strength um, activities on two days for adults and three for children. Uh, if you're an older adult, uh, then looking at also incorporating some multi-component exercise that really um, is that functional balance and strength type of activities. Uh, limit the amount of time that you're um, not moving around, that you're sedentary, and try and replace that with any type of physical activity, even if it's light. And that it's likely if you do more than the recommended, it's likely to have um, additional benefits for you. So that was the guidelines um, at the time. And uh, and so that's been um, a really, there has been um, some criticisms of, of how these guidelines were developed, but um, overall from, from my experience in Australia, having these international guidelines has been a really good starting point for um, us being able to, uh, even when thinking about um, insurance companies and making recommendations um, for, for people who are living with disability about being active, that we have specific guidelines that we can talk about for, for people living with disability. So it, it has really made a difference. And so um, 
A few years ago, uh, we have, uh, with, at a national level, uh, the government developed this Medical Research Future Fund. And within, and we call it the MRFF, and within it, uh, they have particular priority areas that they focus on. And one of the priority areas that came up was traumatic brain injury. And so there's now been a 10-year mission on traumatic brain injury. And so the aim of it is to provide $50 million uh, to support research with the aim to improve the lives of people living with traumatic brain injury. And so in 2020, they had a call out uh, and one of the, the grants that uh, was advertised was a small incubator grant. And the idea was to, to look at developing a small scale project um, to look at best practice, evidence-based care for TBI and to really look at that consistent care was being delivered uh, within health for people living with um, moderate to severe traumatic brain injury. Uh, and so with the, um, with the recent release of the WHO guidelines, it seemed like a really good opportunity to look at could we use those guidelines to look at how they are suitable for people living with traumatic brain injury? So could we evaluate the fit of them? And then could we adapt them to create them as clinical practice guidelines uh, for people living with TBI in Australia? And then from that, then looking at how we could go about planning for implementing these guidelines into practice. And so that's what we put forward and we were successful uh, with getting this grant. And so overall, what we aimed to do um, was to develop clinical practice guidelines and then to create a plan for how we were going to implement them. From the guidelines uh, of the grant, this is what we needed to include in our guidelines. So they needed to be to consider all age groups, so children, adolescents, adults, and older adults living with moderate to severe traumatic brain injury. We had to consider covering the whole trajectory of someone's journey, so from when they have injury to when they're getting back into the community. And we had to think about how we could account for variations in care pathways, so particularly people living in rural and remote um, Australia as well. And we also had to think about how we would encompass all of Australia for these guidelines. So although they spoke about it being a small project, it really was quite a, a large piece of work that we needed to come together. And so I brought together an amazing uh, team to be able to do this. So a range of, of researchers and clinicians uh, and people living with TBI and um, consumer organizations for TBI. Uh, and we've we through the project, we engage with a number of you know fantastic people through our stakeholder groups. And we had some students working on the project uh, and also had an amazing facilitator when it came down to uh, actually running our guideline group. In particular, um, we ha I have an amazing team um, who have done a whole heap of work over the last two years to pull this together and certainly couldn't have done any of this work without this amazing team. So uh, led by Dr. Liam Johnson, who's a postdoc fellow on this, and so he's an exercise physiologist. Uh, Dr. Abby Haynes, who is an amazing qualitative researcher and so led all the qualitative work. And Sakina and Kerry, who are both physiotherapists, um, were our research officers, and Belinda, our research assistant, who's an exercise physiologist. So really just acknowledging uh, this team. So when I went about uh, thinking how we were going to put forward the work we were going to do, um, as I mentioned, I have an interest in implementation science. And so I looked to that and really thought, because we were um, the whole aim of this uh, project was to create these guidelines, but also then to plan for implementation. I thought that perhaps an implementation science framework might really help to step out exactly what we wanted to do. And so we ended up uh, deciding to use the EPIS framework. Um, some of you may have heard of it. Uh, so it's, it's sort of broken into four stages that you work through um, as part of implementation. So it's a process model. Uh, so exploration, preparation, implementation, and sustainment. Now, it looks like a very complex um, 
a complex model, uh, but you can break it down to look much simpler. And it worked really nicely for the grant uh, application that I was doing. So I was really clearly able to show that for this part of the grant, um, what we were interested in doing was just focusing on the exploration component and on the preparation component. And so then by doing all that work, it then sets us up for the next uh, next grant application and the next phase of the work, which will be looking at implementation and then sustainment. So just to run you through what we put forward that we would do to, to work out how we could develop these clinical practice guidelines. So first of all, um, we looked at, we did the exploration phase. And so what we were interested in um, was first of all, assessing the fit of the guidelines. So we were looking at the WHO guidelines and looking at where, how well they were gonna fit our purpose of what we wanted to do. And so because the WHO guidelines didn't include traumatic brain injury, then we did a rapid review of the evidence uh, to look at um, you know, whether there was any reason why we shouldn't be recommending what the WHO recommend um, is done in TBI and also whether there's any additional evidence that supports that we should be promoting physical activity in traumatic brain injury. Another part of trying to work out the fit of the guidelines was, was really wanting to make sure we understood about the preferences for physical activity for people living with traumatic brain injury. You know, I, was, I certainly knew that there, there probably wasn't enough um, opportunities and appropriate opp opportunities out in the community for people to be physically active, but we didn't want to just presume what uh, people with TBI wanted out there. And so we decided that we wanted to do some work to understand what type of physical activity they're most interested in participating about, participating in. So we conducted a qualitative research to develop what's called a discrete choice experiment, uh, which is an economic survey to understand people's preferences. And within that, we also then looked at the physical activity levels of people with TBI. So we uh, included that within our discrete choice experiment survey. So the next part of um, the exploration phase is then thinking about where these guidelines are actually going to be um, used. And so for, for us, this is uh, health services, particularly rehabilitation services around Australia, who work with people living with moderate to severe traumatic brain injury. And so to understand more about that setting and where the guidelines would be, would be um, implemented, we did an audit of services across Australia. And then finally, we want to also think about the outer setting, so not within the health services, but what other um, people and uh, organisations are really important and have an impact on the success or the challenges of people with traumatic brain injury being able to be physically active. And so we spoke to a number of different stakeholder groups to understand what their perspectives were on some of the suitability of the WHO guidelines, but also then some of the, the barriers and some of the facilitators um, from their perspective for people with TBI to be active. And so from doing all these um, components, uh, that was then going to lead us to uh, developing what our clinical practice guidelines are. And so we then have a draft version. And so this is where we're at at the moment is that we have our draft version. And so we're in our preparation phase at the moment, which is where the guidelines are out for public consultation and we're um, speaking further with our range of stakeholders and uh, checking the suitability. So really just finalising the guidelines um, in preparation for implementation. And so this is what we're just up to in these last couple of months. All right, so just to run you through some of the different projects uh, that we've done uh, to get us to our guidelines, and, and then I'll present the guidelines at the end. Uh, so the first one was the rapid review, and so this was published at the beginning of this year, and this was led by uh, Liam Johnson, our postdoc. And so we identified, uh, so for, for our rapid review, what we started with was just trying to identify the very highest quality evidence 
about the effectiveness of physical activity interventions. And so we only included randomised controlled trials. Uh, we found 23 studies, which included 812 people living with moderate to severe traumatic brain injury. And the majority, um, well, not the majority, uh, uh, yeah, we had a lot of um, people who had a severe TBI in that. Um, and on average, people were quite a number of years post-injury as well. Uh, so we found no studies in older adults. We found very little um, studies in children and adolescents, and the majority of studies are conducted in working age adults. Um, these usually include people from 15 years and older, because this is uh, certainly here in Australia, our brain injury units, that's our um, inclusion criteria is, is 15 to 65, so that working age. Uh, there was a mix of where these studies were conducted, so in inpatient and community settings. Uh, and so looking at the different types of physical activity, so a few studies looked at the promotion of physical activity. A few studies specifically looked at sport and physical recreation. Uh, we had a couple of studies that uh, were multi-components, so we included um, a range of these different types of physical activities. By far, the majority looked at um, gait balance or functional type of physical activity. Uh, we found no studies on strength training and a few on aerobic strength train, uh, aerobic training. Uh, and one of one of the many challenges of this was that there was no there's no clear outcomes that are used in these studies. So we found over eighty. Um, health related different outcome measures that we used across these 30, these 23 studies. Uh, and so that made it very difficult to be able to pull data together. Um, but we had a, we were able to do a few meta-analysis um, for a couple of our outcome measures that we were interested in. Um, but we only found in out of these meta-analysis, we just found very low, quality evidence uh, just for one of our measures um, for balance uh, with the use of virtual reality. So overall, we initiated this review um, to uh, look at the fit um, and suitability for physical activity in TBI um, to think about the what the WHO guidelines were recommending. We found no evidence of really significant adverse events from physical activity participation. So that was still an important finding. So there's no reason why we shouldn't be promoting physical activity. Um, but the evidence was pretty limited uh, with, in TBI for what we could say. Um, and this isn't surprising. This is what we expected. And really, um, you know, I'm not sure if any of you have been involved in guideline development work before, but... Um, you typically just, you know, do these systematic reviews, look at the evidence and make your recommendations. But um, we really knew that there was going to be limited direct TBI evidence to help us. And so that's why we've planned all these other studies uh, around it to help inform our development of the guidelines. So the next study we went into was trying to develop our discrete choice experiment. And so this is where we've done qualitative work with people living with TBI to understand their experiences. And our, our methods for conducting this uh, study, so the qualitative work to develop our discrete choice experiment, uh, was published this year as well. And this was led by Abby Haynes, our qualitative researcher. So what we really set out to do was to work collaboratively with people with TBI to identify and describe uh, physical activity attributes um, and their levels. So as in the uh, types of physical activity. Um, so what are the key um, choices that people make? What are the key uh, features of physical activity that make people choose whether or not to participate in physical activity. So uh, travel, cost, who's doing the activity, um, the type of activity it is. So they're the different types of attributes that we were wanting to understand. And from understanding what the most important attributes were, then we wanted to be able to develop a survey um, that was really suitable for people with TBI to be able to complete. 
So we did a qualitative study. It was all online uh, with focus groups and interviews. And the reason that we did it this way is, again, that we're meant to cover all of Australia. So um, we really needed to do it um, online so that we can invite as many people from all over Australia to participate. Uh, so we did it in three rounds. So the first round of focus groups were really just broadly exploring people's preferences about physical activity. From there, we generated um, our list of attributes. And so then our second round of um, focus groups were really refining what these key features were and then thinking about what the different levels of them may be. So the simplest one to give you is cost. So if we decided that cost was an important attribute, then what were the values that we were going to put in there? So free, you know, $10, $20, $50, $100, for example. So we had to work out what the levels should be. Uh, so then our third round, so we created the survey, the discrete choice experiment survey, and then we did uh, interviews and used think aloud techniques so that the person talked through um, as they were doing the survey to, to make sure that they were understanding how the survey worked and what they needed to fill in. And so we were able to refine it uh, based on this work. So that worked really well. Uh, we recruited people who were 10 years and older. Um, and so we were really trying to get that range of children, adolescents, adults, and older adults uh, to help inform. And we recruited mostly by a consumer organization. And so we ended up including 22 uh, people with TBI, 50-50% um, uh, males and females. They ranged in age from 14 to 65. Um, the majority were more than five years post-injury and they were located across four of our Australian states. Uh, so from our going through our second round, we ended up coming uh, down to seven attributes that were decided upon. So. Um, these were the most important uh, features of, of choice when people uh, were deciding whether to take up a new physical activity. So the type of activity it is, uh, the out-of-pocket costs per session, the travel time to get to the activity, who else is doing the activity, who's facilitating the activity, and the accessibility of the setting and well-being as well. Through our Think Aloud process, um, we refined uh, particularly our survey instructions. Um, we we've fixed up the wording of the attributes. Uh, we provided examples uh, of the levels. And we ended up removing uh, this seventh attribute of well-being because it, um, from the Think Aloud process, it was really uh, it wasn't really coming into people's choices when they were deciding whether they would do it or not. So we pulled it out and we've added it as a separate question within the full survey. So this survey is now, is actually still live. Um, it's for Australian people living with moderate to severe TBI. Uh, it's online and I think we're up to, I think about 50 people have filled it in so far. Uh, we're hoping to get about 200 to complete it in the end. So this is just an example of what one of the questions looks like. So within the survey, they're presented with six of these scenarios and it's randomised as to how these uh, turn up for, for the different people. Um, but they get asked this question. So would you be willing to add this physical activity to your current weekly schedule? And so then they have to consider the type of activity. So this one's a sport with informal competition for fun. It's going to cost them no money. Uh, the travel time is only five minutes or less to get there. It's organised with people with any type of disability. It's facilitated by a person with experience of the activity, but no experience working with people with disability. And the accessibility is manageable or not ideal. And so the idea of these is that if there's a particular, um, so they consider all these different components and decide yes or no whether they would um, take take up this activity and so by pulling the discrete choice experiment you can learn if there's particular attributes that are really strong drivers of people's choice um, and so then we're hoping that this work will really help us to advocate for the types of physical activity that um, people with TBI want to participate in. Uh, so 
um, from those uh, focus groups that we did, we did still just learn more broadly around um, some of the experiences of people with TBI, uh, you know, what they think about physical activity. And so, um, you know, we're still doing more work on this data, but these are sort of some of the preliminary ideas that have come from these focus groups. Uh, and so the first one is really about this tension between their pre-injury activity versus new activity. Um, so uh, people, uh, you know, a lot of people after TBI, it's obviously an acquired disability. And so they have a history of participation in physical activity. And so sometimes the activities that they partic participated in previously can be a really strong driver for them to want to get back into that activity but sometimes it can be challenging if they're not able to perform how they used to. And so it's this real um, challenge between wanting to get back to um, what they used to do versus taking on new activities. Um, really strongly from the focus groups came up about um, how physical activity is important in giving them a sense of connection with other people. So often they feel isolated um, at home after a TBI. And so physical activity is a really great opportunity to connect with other people. Um, they talked about being able to push themselves within the physical activity and that that was important. Um, and a lot of people saw this as part of their work, particularly if they um, weren't employed then their physical activity was a really important part of their working day and they saw it as, you know, work as part of their rehabilitation. Um, we initially started with the term leisure-based physical activity, but they hated the idea of that because for many of them it was really considered work. Um, but within this, they really needed to work within their abilities so that fatigue, which is such a common problem after traumatic brain injury, that that didn't become a problem for them. And finally, the hidden disabilities. So many people with traumatic brain injury um, may not have really significant physical uh, impairments. And it might be that there's more cognitive, um, uh, cognitive or behavioural impairments. And so sometimes um, them not having obvious disabilities can be really challenging for them participating in community activities and not necessarily wanting to disclose about their brain injury, but having challenges with being able to connect in with um, mainstream activities. So the next thing we did was look at uh, the brain injury services and what they actually delivered. So we uh, conducted an audit of both specialist and non-specialist brain injury services. And we were interested in how they went about uh, delivering and promoting physical activity uh, within the rehab um, phase of, um, uh, of the journey for someone with TBI. And so we were interested in fitness, strength, uh, functional balance and gait, group-based activities, sport and physical activity. We, we also looked at play-based activity for the paediatric services and then how they went about promoting overall physical activity. And so we have a National Rehab Outcomes Centre, and so we worked with them to identify uh, the services across Australia that have uh, that work with people with moderate to severe traumatic brain injury, and they were invited to uh, participate in the audit. So we ended up including uh, 26 services. Uh, the majority were adult services. So we had 20 adult services, five paediatrics, and one service that looked after all age groups. Um, we were able to get services from all of our eight states and territories in Australia. The majority were from major cities, but we had uh, two from our inner regional and two from outer regional Australia included. 47% um, were specialist brain injury rehab services. We had 15% non-specialist, so your typical uh, inpatient rehab service. Uh, we had uh, outpatient, um, oh, I spelled that wrong, uh, or domiciliary uh, rehab private practices. And then we had a range of a few others. So we had an acute, uh, acute inpatient setting, uh, and some transitional services as well. So 26 services that we looked at. Um, and firstly, we, we asked them about, you know, whether they do actually deliver these different activities. And so not, um, not 
unsurprising that um, this was predominantly filled in by physiotherapists and exercise physiologists. And so they do report that overall that they are delivering these types of activities. So we can say that's great, um, uh, particularly aerobic training. So most of the peds and all of the adult services were doing it. Every service said that they were doing some strength training. Uh, every service was doing mobility training. So we would hope that they were doing these things in rehab, um, a mix as to whether they had group-based components, um, a bit more of a mix around whether they provided uh, sport and physical recreation activities. So that wasn't as common in the adult services. Um, obviously, all the, the paediatric services did their um, unstructured play. And the majority of them did say that they uh, talked with their patients about the benefits of physical activity, discussed guidelines and, and talked about um, how to be physically active um, when they're leaving. Um, so that looks good. Perhaps we don't need guidelines. Um, but what we actually see is when you delve in more, that there's actually a lot of variation in how these um, act, how these physical activities are actually delivered. Um, so if we go back to, to my area of, of the fitness training that I'm most interested in, uh, that there's, if, you know, when you're um, developing a fitness training program, then the first thing you need to do is to do a fitness test to um, develop the actual proper dosage. And we can see that this isn't done at all in paediatric services and not done um, very much in adult services as well. And there's a variation in, in how they um in how they, uh, the different types of modes that they use to deliver fitness training. Uh, so then just moving on to our outer context. So we spoke to a range of different um, serve, uh, different stakeholders. So these were the groups that we felt were most important that um, can assist and can um, perhaps hinder people with TBI uh, being able to be physically active when they're moving out into the community. Uh, so we spoke to a range of people with TBI, their family members, private health professionals, uh, which was uh, predominantly physios, but also exercise physiologists, case managers, OTs, recreation officers as well. Uh, we spoke to a range of community physical activity providers, uh, support workers or attendant care workers, and then those who fund so within Australia, we have a national disability insurance scheme. Um, so we spoke to people through that. And then if people have a traumatic brain injury from a motor vehicle accident or from workers' compensation, uh, then there's also um, funding for that as well. So we spoke to the funders who make the decisions about whether they will fund physical activity. Uh, and so we are still... Uh, we got lots of very rich information um, about, uh, about physical activity from these different stakeholder groups. And so we're still working our way through that, but we've, we've looked at um, presenting it using the socio-ecological model. So really identifying a number of barriers and facilitators at the individual level. Um, so... Um, for example, the fatigue came out as a real big challenge um, in, in many of the different um, stakeholder groups. Um, finding the right fit, you know, the right type of physical activity for that person, uh, making decisions around risk for getting back to physical activity, the different types of physical activity, um, the challenges of motivation and getting people to start being active. Um, so all of those sort of things came out in the individual side. Uh, at the interpersonal uh, level, the importance of um, the support systems that were around helping the person with TBI to be active, and that included family and friends, the health professional, the support workers, and also the exercise providers. Uh, and then moving into the community uh, factors, some of the challenges of access to being able to um, get into facilities to be physically active, uh, what options were actually available in the community and how to find out about them. And then when moving to the policy level, uh, the funding um, is such a challenge. It's a really complex system. Um, there's inconsistency and not good transparency on what things get approved and what things don't get approved. And so um, people with TBI particularly found and family members found a lot of challenges with navigating this. And 
Overall, what we saw is that it's a really siloed um, area for people with TBI to navigate through their journey. So the disability sector, the health sector, the community sector and the school sector, but they don't work well together. And so that makes it really challenging as people have their journey through and, and wanting to get back to physical activities. So from there, from all of that work together, we then uh, moved towards actually developing our guidelines. And so we used a grade approach, which um, if you've been involved in guideline development work before, you will have heard of that. Um, and so what the actual process we used is called grade development. And this is because we were considering the WHO guidelines. So uh, dollopment stands for whether you decide to adopt the guidelines you're interested in, whether you look at adapting them, or whether you create de novo, so brand new guidelines. Um, and so we followed that process. So we established a leadership team, we had a guideline development group, we identified, uh, so we had our WHO guidelines, but we also looked for any other credible guidelines that we could use. Uh, we evaluated the evidence that we had and we used what's called an evidence to decision framework to do that. Um, we worked our way through um, making the decisions for, the, um, for all the criteria, which I'll show you in a minute. And then we moved to stakeholder consultation and that's where we're at at the moment in our process. So we had 10 questions, so they're all in the PICO format, so population intervention comparison and outcomes. And so these are the same things that we've been um, looking at in our other studies. So aerobic exercise, muscle strengthening, gait balance and function. We originally had multi-component, but we've ended up um, not using those two and just moving the uh, evidence on that into the different um, other ones. Uh, we looked at sport and physical recreation and then overall physical activity promotion. And so for each of those different types of physical activity, we looked at children and adolescents, and then we looked at adults and older adults. And so this is how we've kind of pulled everything together. So we started with our rapid review, our step one that I mentioned. Uh, we then at the same time, we've then been doing all of those bridge, the, the projects that I've just gone through, our qualitative uh, projects and our audits. Um, our we've also reviewed relevant guidelines that could be used. And then our decision was that um, we would be able to use some of the information from these guidelines, but really we wanted to create new guidelines. So de novo guidelines are going to be suitable for um, our purpose. And so we re-ran our rapid review, but this time because we knew there was limited evidence in our high quality RCTs, we also included non-randomised trials. And so we've ended up having 128 studies that have also helped to inform the development of our guidelines. So you can just sort of see that we've pulled in evidence from a range of different places. Um, this is a complex uh, figure, but it just is one of our processes that we use when we were considering non-randomized studies, then we just um, made decisions as to uh, whether we, you know, what would, when would we include that lower quality evidence to, to inform our guidelines. Uh, then we use this grade approach. So if we have a randomized controlled trial, the uh, certainty of evidence starts at very high. Then we consider uh, with the evidence that we have the risk of bias, inconsistency, uh, how direct the evidence is, how precise it is, and if there's any publication bias. And based on those, we our evidence may then get downgraded um, yeah, to lower level quality. Uh, so this is, uh, if, again, if any of you have been involved in guideline development, these is, this is the evidence to decision framework. So for each of these criteria, you're making a decision around um, the importance of them and looking at the evidence for each of these. So for each of our PICOs, so what each of our questions, we were needing to decide, is it a big enough problem that there should be a guideline? What do we know about the desirable effects uh, for that um, type of physical activity? What do we know about the undesirable effects? How certain are we of the evidence? Uh, what are people's values about that activity? So on balance, should we therefore recommend it or not recommend it? 
uh, what sort of resources are required, how certain are we about the costs of it, are there any considerations about equity and how acceptable and feasible is it. So we were able to use our all those studies that we've done within our project to help inform a number of these criteria, as well as looking at the evidence. And from there, we make a recommendation and we think about any subgroups that need to be considered and then plan for implementation. Uh, and so um, the guideline, the guideline uh, development group are the ones who make that decision on um, for each of our recommendations. And so um, just to give you a little bit of a feel about those who are living with TBI, um, who are involved. Um, so we had a member on our leadership group um, who, was, uh, who was living with traumatic brain injury. Before we ran our guideline development process, we met with um, our national advocacy group for Brain Injury Australia to make sure that they felt we were um, doing everything we could to um, make it as easy as possible for people with TBI to be involved. Um, so then before we had our guideline development meetings, uh, we sent all the documents to um, all our members. I also recorded a video going through it all for them and we sent it um, in advance. We then offered uh, those living with TBI to a, a session before we ran the actual guideline meetings um, to go over the process. And so we ended up having seven people living with TBI who participated in our guideline development group and two family members. And our guideline development meetings, so to make our final recommendations, uh, we initially had two four-hour meetings online planned um, but our first four hour meeting, we actually got through one of our 10 recommendations that we had to make. So we ended up having five meetings uh, online. So a total of 13 and a half hours to develop the guidelines and um, people living with TBI who participated uh, were fantastic and uh, and contributed so well uh, to the meeting and, and provided really rich information. So um, was really pleased with how that process went. So this is what our guidelines look like. This is our front cover. And so our front cover, um, that painting is from uh, Gabby Vassallo, who is our uh, person with lived experience who's on our leadership group. Uh, and so this is uh, what she's written um, uh, to describe the painting that she's done. And I think it's just such a beautiful, a beautiful painting for what we are trying to get across. Um, and it's a really um, important showing her, her journey in having a traumatic brain injury. So it's great. Uh, so we've ended up, we've got 10 recommendations. So we have two strong recommendations. So around muscle strength, thinning exercise and task specific mobility training. And these are both for adults and older adults. So we recommend four of these interventions and we have strong evidence. But the rest of our recommendations, we're only able to make conditional recommendations. And that's just really because of the quality of the evidence. So, um, but for all of our 10 PICO questions, so we have recommended that these interventions should be delivered. So we've got aerobic exercise for adults and children. We've got the muscle strengthening for children um, and mobility for children. And then we have sport and rec for adults and children and promotion of physical activity. So there are our 10 uh, recommendation statements that were developed by the guideline group. And then for each of these uh, recommendations, and we have a number of good practice points that help to um, pull it all together. And so this is just an example of one of them here. You're in trouble. Uh, so our guidelines You're in are trouble. No are TV, current, no phone. And no bus for one week. Our guidelines are currently out for uh, public consultation. And so um, when I finish this, I'll also send you the, the link um, to Leslie if she doesn't mind, because very happy for anyone to, to review and to make um, any comments. And they're open until the 6th of October. Uh, so in summary, I, I hope that gives you a, a bit of an idea of the process that we went through to develop our clinical practice guidelines. So we started off thinking about the WHO guidelines, and so they've just been such a great starting point uh, and for really pushing the idea of physical activity for people living with disability. 
um, we were able to use implementation science and the grade development process to be rigorous and systematic in how we went about developing our guidelines. It was really important for us that we had a really strong lived experience voice throughout the guideline development process. Um, and I think importantly, the, the main aim of this is that um, we're helping people with TBI to be able to uh, benefit from physical activity. So it um, feels like a huge uh, step to get to this point, but we're just really starting in our, our next stage of really planning for how we're going to disseminate, but then also look at how we're going to implement these guidelines into practice. Um, and thank you very much. So with that, while I'm pulling up the evaluation link, um, does anyone have any questions? I, I don't see, again, you can feel free to post it in the chat or call it out. We have a few more minutes before the 4.30 time. I, I had a quick question. That was really good, Leanne, thank you. Um, when, when you're putting the guidelines together at the end, are you gonna, you, you mentioned at the start a lot of the, um, the potential benefits of physical activity for people with traumatic brain injury. When you roll out the the implementation of the guidelines, will you uh, highlight um, the will will the some of the outcomes be be emphasized? For example, um, whatever psychological well being, functions functional outcomes, um, behavior, yeah. th those types of the things. Yes, so they they are in there, but yeah, they are at the back. So they they helped us to for each of our decisions for recommending the guidelines. We looked at about six or seven critical and important outcomes as part of the process. So they are they are in there. They're not they are at the back though. So it's a good question, Stephen, whether you, whether it should be further at the front. Um, yeah. So yeah, they're definitely in there, but it's a 230 page document. So um, yeah, perhaps we need to think about how we can move some of that stuff forward as well. Yeah. Great, yeah, thank you. We, we, yeah. And so I think, it, Dr. Hassett, I appreciate you sharing the link. I'll definitely circulate that um, to have all of those in depth that you spoke of in the end, that link. The, the recommendations to the guideline will, will be nice to look at. I think for people who are in the front line here would like to see the activities that link to a guideline. So yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? Real quick, I had a method question. Many people on here might already know about it. Can you tell us what the think aloud technique you used is for the DCE survey? Give it a brief description. Yeah, so um, it, the, the idea of it is that as people are stepping through a process that they're talking out loud as they go through the process so you can see what their thinking process is to see whether it actually makes sense and how easy it is. So, you know, it's, it's sometimes it's used when you're trying to test out a new technology, for example, and you're trying to see how easy it is. So uh, in this process, um, they had the, the survey up online and they talked through as they were working their way through the survey. Um, what we found, we didn't push them to talk all the time because it's kind of that dual tasking, which can be a bit challenging for people when you do have cognitive impairment as well. So sometimes we would let them talk, think, you know, go through a little bit of it and then um, come back and, and say what they understood about it, about the, the questions and the instructions. Um, but it was really useful The you know, for example, the, you know, obviously we fixed up the, you know, words that didn't make sense and sections that didn't make sense for people, but even just the formatting and we ended up having uh, sections where there was quite um, a lot of text, you know, the consent process that you always have to have that's always too long for people to read. Uh, we ended up having that as an audio option so that the survey is an online survey and so they can actually click on a little button and they can have it read to them rather than having to read all those long bits and stuff as well. And uh, yeah, just how it's set out, it, it really did help. And and the we wouldn't have picked up around that well-being that people just weren't taking that and they were really, they were bringing their own in. The, the well-being was really mucking up the, the decisions on choice because they were just going, oh, well, I know that this is going to make me feel good. So even if the the scenario put forward was that um, they would have a, it wouldn't improve their well-being, 
they would just read the scenario and go, oh, but I know that that's going to make me feel good. So they would kind of discount the, the well-being one. And so that's why we decided to remove it. So the Think Aloud really helped us to understand that. That's really interesting. Thanks for describing. Okay. All right. Well, we are at the 4.30 here, Eastern um, time. And, and we just really appreciate everyone joining us. Um, Dr. Hassett, thank you for joining us and sharing your work. We look forward to seeing that. Um, document and providing public comment at the stage you're in. We appreciate that opportunity. Um, we do see in a chat for CEUs for the certificate, please fill out the evaluation. We do have registration for today and we can get you those certificates in a follow-up email. So um, yes, Jessica, you can, uh, can't can scan the QR code. Absolutely, that can be emailed. I'll do that later. So other than the housekeeping items, and feel free to email me after this if you didn't get a chance to put it in the chat. I th again, I think um, I thank everyone for your time and hope you have a nice day. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.